But I think what we're here today to maybe think even more about, and I think what, what Jeff is an excellent example of, is advocacy beyond those moments we have with students. How can we be advocates in our classrooms, in our schools, in our departments, and even beyond that, um, in New York State and even <coughs> nationally? Um, this is a time filled with a lot of emotion in education, and I find myself wavering between excitement and frustration, and it's a really uh, emotional experience being a teacher, and I think we need to put all that energy into thinking about how we specifically, uniquely, each can be advocates. And that's going to look differently for each of us. Um, Jeff is a teacher, ultimately. Um, he started as a counselor, residential counselor, in outdoor education. He worked in the Peace Corps. I just found out it was Thailand. As I was kind of reading about him, I was just continually impressed with your, ex your wealth of experience. He's been at Tapestry Charter School since 2007 and works as an ELA teacher as well as helping out with administrative uh, work. And in addition to that, he's also started the Educators um, for a Better Buffalo and the Reading Invasion process. I, I don't know where you have the time. It's incredible. But I think what you're doing is taking the experiences that you have with students, with kids, with other teachers, and you're broadening them to Western New York. And you're making it a place that I want to keep living in. And you're making it a place that I think we're all going to want to keep sending our, our kids to school in. So, um, I'm thrilled to hear what you have to say, and I'm looking forward to a conversation afterward about how we can all be the best advocates possible for everyone, our kids, us. So, Jeff, without further ado, let's give a round of applause. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for coming today. I have this like, sort of strange, I'm not really sure where I want to stand, because I behind the lecture seems very awkward and distant, but I also sort of have that strange sense of like t talking in front of groups and just as a teacher, like you don't prepare like a speech, right, when you go to teach a class, right? You don't write out your thoughts, they're sort of there, you can prepare, maybe you write a lesson plan, but it's not like this formal lecture, but I did that, right? Like I wrote out like a large speech because I wanted to be, <laughs> I wanted to be very precise um, in, in the things that I say because this stuff really matters and it helped me get my thoughts together. Um, but it also feels very strange and stuffy, and so I'm going to try to like both read this and, and not go off on too many tangents, but forgive me if I'm sort of buried sometimes in my words, um, and I'll try to sort of keep, keep things um, from going off the rails too much. Um, but particularly, I'm really thankful that, to be part of this conversation today around education policy. Um, I really want to thank um, the Western New York Network English teachers, the officers who invited me, um, Jim, who introduced me to this group a couple years ago, and um, also helps out a little bit with, with our group. Um, and I've just been so impressed over this past year with Jim to see how, how community is to sort of empowering educators um, and connecting educators. That's a, a really important role that our universities play. And um, it's great to have you sort of part of this, this larger network that we have here. And since she's here, I really want to just give a, a big shout out to my principal, Lynn Bass, who's sitting over there. Um, <laughs> Lynn has been, I've been a to now for six years, and she has been, besides a really good friend and an incredible mentor, um, as, a, as a leader of our building, she is, it's perfect that she's here today because she is one of those leaders who embodies, um, I think, or understands both intellectually and intuitively um, the importance of giving teachers voice in their school. Um, and not just because that's like what you do to respect professionals, um, but it's also what makes really good schools. And um, it's been such an incredible sort of journey to be at Tapestry for six years and, and feeling that, understanding the, the, the benefit of, of that, not just because you're supposed to it because it's really the best policy uh, to have teachers as a part of that. And so um, I also really want to thank um, all of you here today for this opportunity to sort of talk through um, this really important issue. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, I want us to sort of, one of the things I'm going to talk about today is like wrestling with this tension um, between different views of, of education. Some really, I would say, difficult issues. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking today to have, both to share some ideas with you, but also to this conversation that we can have I'm going to try to make sense of that and just like be comfortable with those tensions and, and it's sort of advanced. Thank you for that. Um, and I really am so excited to be part of this conversation. I, just, I like that word so much, right? This isn't me sort of like sharing with you my truths and everything that I know we should be doing, but it's really a chance for me to like work through my thoughts on this. Um, and so sort of bear with me as I work through my thoughts. Um, then also to, um, to hear from you and to have a conversation around um, what is not a clear-cut issue and something that we all sort of need to struggle with a little bit. Um, so that's where I want to start today with my own thinking. Um, and I'd like to say that this is less of a lecture or speech 
and more of like a written conversation with myself. Um, one that I hope will spur you know, deeper conversation today. But there's four main points that will dictate what I'm going to talk about today, um, with some room to sort of be built in for some, for some tangents. Um, so the first one is this, is that improvement in our education system only comes when the practice of teaching more closely dictates the policy of education. I'm going to say that again because I think it's important for so the framework for what I'm going to say. But improvement in our education system only really comes when the practice of teaching more closely dictates the policy of education, not the other way around. Right? I think for too long, policy has pushed, pushed our practice. Right? And the problem with that is that those who create policies aren't usually the ones who understand practice the best. Right? Uh, number two, I, I find that education policy often seems much further away from practice than it really is. And making it seem very remote and disconnected from what each of us do each day. Right? It seems distant, but I argue that it's, it's not. Right? To most teachers, getting involved in policy, right, or school reform, or education leadership, or education scholarship, all those sort of things we build on to our classrooms, um, seem and feel like unfunded mandates. Right? They're only attracted to those individuals who have extra time who are hyperly motivated, right, or those who are looking to move on, move beyond the classroom eventually. But it seems only those are the ones that it's accessible to, when I would argue that it's not. And lastly, teachers and building administrators are the one group that is most capable of bridging the gap between the policies of education and the practice of teaching. Right? And because of this last statement, teachers and administrators have the most potential to help us improve our education system. And because of that, Teachers and administrators must become more involved in connecting policy to practice. I want to argue that teachers have and should have a professional responsibility to see themselves as change agents, to see themselves not just as deliverers of instruction, but as the voice of the direction of our schools. And I guess I want to add like a sort of fifth element here that I'm not going to spend as much time on, but I think it's important. It's something that Amanda had mentioned in something that I saw this week. Um, that as teachers, I think we have a responsibility to model what we teach, right? So if you think of like the average high schooler, the life of a high school student, right? They take six to eight classes, right, and try to balance all of them, right? We encourage them to get jobs and plan sports teams, um, have a social life and be a part of their family. And then we, like if you're our school, we sort of demand that they volunteer on their own, right? Um, and if they get their, hat, reds hat, their heads wrapped around all those things, then we say that you are also the leaders of tomorrow and the agents of change themselves. Right? So if we continue to ask these of our young, then shouldn't we have an obligation to model this ourselves? Right? So what I'm looking at today is make an argument that while to an in-service teacher, education policy can be very distant and removed, it couldn't be closer. Right? And if it is, as I will argue, much closer than we think, then it's imperative to our profession that we become more informed, more involved, and more influential. And if all this is true, then we should talk about ways to do that, which is what I'm really excited to, to do today. So I want to start by reading to you from an article I came across recently. Um, it's called, <laughs> you can't, They Can't Take the System and You Can't Blame Them, How We Drive Teachers to Quit. Really uplifting so title. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the problem in our system right now, right? With many, particularly young teachers, not staying in the classroom. Um, and the high rate of teachers that do leave it. And my goal, I really don't want to talk about that issue today specifically, um, but I think it's instructive right, to, to look at this particular part. And I also think that by addressing how teachers impact policy, we can also address why so many teachers don't make it to the point where they can. As you all know, so like a side note, right, like the first few years of teaching like, is not about getting involved in education policy, right? it's about just managing to stay afloat, right? To figure out how to go to the bathroom between classes when you're on break, right? <laughs> to just manage 25 or 75 or 125 kids. Um, but when you get to the point in your practice where you're ready for that, unfortunately, so many teachers don't get there. And why that happens is really important. So from this article, there's a few, a few quotes. It says, first of all, it says that too many teachers will quit permanently because they are fed up, right? And it says, while low pay in public schools helps drive out top teachers, and just a side note, I don't know if people saw, there's a really nice they've written article by the author Dave Eggers just like, two days ago in the New York Times about teacher pay mm -hmm. and why that issue is still pretty um, relevant. So check that out if you get a chance. I actually brought a copy of it up here too. Um, 
goes on to say, there is another less known but deeply important factor. Teachers leave the profession because their satisfaction and enthusiasm have been su finally suffocated by what they call the system. And then the article goes on to say, the system is comprised of, quote, know-nothing school boards, that was a great way to say it, insecure, inadequate principals, doting parents, rebellious or apathetic children, and poorly trained teachers drawn from the bottom of the college educated groups. Those are the five things that make up the system. Uh, so the article also quotes from a few education experts. A guy from the federal government says, quote, many first rate teachers go into teaching, but they aren't treated as people with enormous talent, great skill, training, or education. And a professor from the Teachers College at Columbia says, quote, the most important problem in education is to get everybody to recognize that teaching really is one of the most important occupations in the country. Right? Great stuff, right? Now, does that resonate with you? Do you feel like it addresses your experiences and problems that we're dealing with today? Um, the article goes on to flush out each of these parts of the system. Right? It talks about all five of those parts. Um, and what it does is suffocate teachers and encourage apathy over career change. And there's another great article a few weeks ago, it talks about, or the poll actually, about teacher engagement. If you guys have seen this, and how it precipitately drops from year one to year five. Right? So, what, what is happening there to make teachers feel less engaged in their profession than when they first started? Yeah. So, it ends, the article ends with this sort of powerful overview of how things are changing, though, right? the stuff we're doing to make that difference. It says, around the country, the education machinery is in the throes of redesign. States are stiffening teacher certification requirements. Leading colleges of education are improving how to teach courses and toughening academic standards. Universities and foundations are rewriting public school curriculum to update them according to today's needs and today's, worlds, today's world. And the last line says, and please listen to this carefully, <laughs> a technological teaching revolution is adding film strips, teaching machines, and education television as an invaluable new resource that can be easily tapped by hard pressed teachers. Right, you guys got that? Right. Film strips. <coughs> yeah. All right. So the article is from Time Magazine. You can see at the top of there why good teachers quit. And the date's November 16, 1962. Right. You guys remember what I said, right? All those things that we heard didn't sound like I was talking about another era, right? So actually, Lynn got this for me. Um, she, found, she was in a, it was like a consignment shop, right? Yes, yeah, in, in Atlanta. In Atlanta. And, uh, and saw it and thought I, should, thought I should have it, which is so great, and brought it back. And so, and I was reading through it, and I thought, that's incredible. Like that, before, like, until you hear about film strips, you think we're describing education now, right? So, for the record, and I didn't change any quotes, right? Film strips is, is the only place where it feels in the right. So, what does this all mean, right? So that's what I want to talk about a little bit. What does it mean, or I guess in the sort of negative side, right? Does it mean that we're caught in some type of like perpetual death spiral of nothing really changing, right? That in 51 years, nothing has really changed? That the issues of classroom teachers aren't any different than they were a half century ago? And if any of this is true, does it leave us with any hope that it's going to get better? That somehow we're doing things different now, or that we're progressing? It is an interesting question, right? Have you ever heard that st there's a stupid joke about the guy who was like frozen in time and they unthaw him today and he's like walking around the world and he is a little like freaked out by television and cell phones and airplanes and all that modern technology and actually stumbles into this like nice looking brick building that happens to be a public school classroom or a school and he walks in and looks in and he immediately feels comfortable. And finally, a place that hasn't actually changed at all, right? It's, it's such a stupid joke, right? Um, but it's, you've heard that argument, right? That our education system was designed for a different era, right? That it was a factory model, that our economic system is different now, but the school system looks the same. That our model crushes all creativity and ingenuity and original thought. Right? That it perpetuates class lines and disenfranchises the poor and the marginalized. Or that worse, the system is once the beacon of the world is now subpar or mediocre putting students well behind their peers in other developed nations. Right? We've heard all those things, right? Um, at the same time, things have changed enormously. Right? Um, 
And I don't just mean in our world, right? Our education system has changed enormously. We know so much more now about how the brain develops. We know more about potential, right, and mindset, and the signs that a student might be at risk. We know more about how the brain responds to trauma, and the role of health and nutrition to play in learning, and the importance of early literacy and parental nurturing. And thanks to innovative teachers like yourselves, right, we have changed the way materials are delivered and higher thinking is encouraged. Teachers and researchers have, over the past half century, uncovered innumerable truths about the way students learn and develop, about how teacher quality and home life impacts student success, and the proper interventions to help, help young people with special needs. Right? Those things have changed. Right? Those things were not a part of Life magazine in 1962. So how do you have these two realities, both which seem rather compelling and rather true, rest with? How does this rest with you? Can you feel the tension between them? What does it mean to feel the weight of those two different narratives? I would argue that being comfortable with those tensions is a prerequisite to anyone seeking to improve our education system, or to work in it for that matter. And in fact, I would argue that good teachers are the only ones capable of both intuitively and intellectually understanding that tension. So what does it, this have to do with this 50 year cycle of good teachers quitting? And what can we do with the knowledge that some things really haven't changed? And what should we do with this long view of history at our disposal? Well, let me read you what the article ends with, because I think it does here actually offer some instructive advice. It says, quote, to be effective, ref to be effective reforms demand the overturning of all the old ingrained habits and attitudes and institutions which allow the system to exist. It demands that everybody, teachers, parents, principals, and pupils, new imagination and determination. Only in this way will America keep its talented teachers and find its better schools. So you don't have to be an education historian to understand that plenty has happened to our system since 1962. All those issues, right, teacher training, standards, curriculum, technology, all the things that said in 62, they were working on changing, have all undergone and continue to undergo transformations. Right? So that's why it sounded so familiar to us. And all this does lead to improvement, no doubt. That's where that tension is, I think. When we get right down to it, what hasn't changed, at least what I don't think has changed, is what the system is doing to teachers and administrators. What hasn't changed is how decisions are passed down, where good ideas come from, how teachers are listened to, and what makes teachers want to quit. So one of the fundamental problems with the ideas of teachers being involved in education policy is that it very often sounds good in theory, but quickly devolves into tokenism and unfunded mandates. Some of you have heard me tell the story, or read about it, I've written a few times about this, about the recent Governor's Education Commission that sort of toured the state, um, and how they work any teachers on it whatsoever. Um, so the story is telling because of what it symbolizes, right? The fact that there's this paradigm where teacher voices are simply not heard in this larger conversation, right? But I think it's just that. It's just symbolic, right? Having teachers on that commission, right, if they decide we're going to put teachers on the commission, probably wouldn't have changed it all that much, right? At least I don't think it would. And what teacher really has time to travel around the state with a bunch of bureaucrats. And the story works as an analogy because it symbolizes something much deeper and much more fundamental about we what we teachers, uh, I'm sorry, it symbolizes something much more deeper and much more fundamental, right? That we teachers have never really controlled the conversation about our profession. And it's only when we do that the system will make the essential leap to connect policy and practice. In some ways, it's only when we invite them to our table that we'll see true change and truly see policy, the practice of teaching and the policy of education come together. The organization that I started, Educators for a Better Buffalo, um, believes this. Western New York Network of English Teachers believes this. Right? And EDB and YNET both function with the same premise, right? that teachers need to be empowered to be change leaders in education. Not that you should become policy experts, right? or politicians, or God forbid, a bureaucrat, but you should stay teachers. 
right? That you should continue to do what you love, but you should become the change that we all wish to see. One of my struggles with my own argument is that it often feels really ambiguous and kind of devoid of like concrete things, right? Like I said, become more involved, read more, study more, like those aren't exactly the tenets of like a powerful movement, right? Um, and I think partially this is that tension that I'm speaking. The tension comes from how complicated the education system is and our awareness of that. And how easy it is to devolve into simplistic ideas when what we need is a complex understanding. I've been reading this book this summer, um, some of you may have um, heard it before. It's by a, a Chicago researcher named Charles Payne. And it's called, it's called no, So Much Reform, So Little Change. You can kind of get a sense of what it's all about. And he's particularly looking at the persistently failing urban schools and why after, like as I said, after 50 years and longer, we continue to see the same problems. Um, and he addresses what I just talked about, I think, really well. I'm just going to read you guys a quick passage from it. And this is not from 1962. This is from 2011. So this is a little more, a little more uh, contemporary. It says, we are reaching a point where it is hard to go to a meeting without hearing calls for innovation or the even more vulgar references to out-of-the-box thinking. Newness becomes a goal in itself. The presumptions embedded in that deification of the new are largely insulting to educators. If we begin, if we begin with the assumption that there are many smart, talented, hardworking people in these schools, we are less likely to accept the notion that there is some bright new idea that's going to fix everything. If that's all it took, the good people in our schools would have figured it out already. We are not smarter than they. Our energies would be better devoted to trying to understand the organizational and environmental characteristics leading people to do so less, so to do so much less than they can. And that's sort of where I want to finish, right? Payne isn't a teacher, right? He acknowledges that he's not a teacher, right? He's a researcher. He's speaking from the other side of this conversation. But he is saying what needs to be said to those who currently control this conversation. But for us, for those of us in the classroom and in school buildings, it is not enough to simply agree with what Payne is saying. For us, it is imperative that we demand to be heard that we see our experiences and our wisdom as essential pieces in the struggle to improve our schools. For us, it is no longer just to concern ourselves with our students, but to understand our larger place in the conversation. For us, it is not enough to complain about how we are treated, how we are perceived, or how we are heard. It is enough when we see ourselves as experts, which is what we are, and demand a seat at the table. This is what Wynet does, that's what EBB is trying to do, and that's what I hope that all of us here today can be about. Well, thank you. I'm done. I'm done. Tell everybody about the reading division. That's hmm. amazing. I, uh, yeah. I'm always excited about reading, but I've never had a venue to yeah, share. Yeah, that's, that's right. We have a room of English teachers, right. So one of the yeah, one of those little style like organizational things is this the Buffalo Reading Invasion. Um, and really what they are, they're very simple. They're just sort of flash mob like reading events where we get together as many people as possible and read. We literally just read for like an hour. Um, but the point of it is to it's a public it's a public event, right? So you know the first one this year we went to Bidwell Parkway and spread ourselves out along the parkway. You know, there's probably three hundred people there. And um, it's not a book club, it's not a everyone reads the same thing, it's just to expose, I mean, one of my bigger purposes is just to expose young people to the fact that there's a really robust um, reading culture in the city, right? And when people model that or see that, then young kids find it. It's something we do at our school, right? We have you know, a silent reading period every day, and that involves all the teachers. I mean, everyone knows that about SS or reading, right? Like, you model it in your classroom, but um, to model that in our city, I think, has in a symbolic way a real potential for that. So, if you guys are interested in that, the Buffalo Reading Invasion, there's a website. Um, there's a Facebook group, there's a Twitter thing, um, and we're going to have another one in September. And a lot of the Wynet's brought little, had a little station each time, um, which is really good. It's the second year, and we're going to continue to do it, maybe even do it through the, the school year. And then the other thing for educators for a better Buffalo, if you guys are interested in 
be on our mailing list or even come into our, we do sort of monthly meetings and it's, we overlap a lot, but we are, we're a little different. We're not just English teachers, we're, so anyone interested in these policies, and it's the same thing with educatorsforbetterbuffalo.com is our website. Um, we also have a Facebook group, and you can just follow us. There's no obligation to membership, just to be part of that conversation and to, to keep up on what's happening here in the state and across the country. But again, it's really, it's tough because it's exhausting sometimes. Right? We all have full-time jobs that do, I understand that. Um, so how do you wanna? We're just gonna transition now. Yeah. Um, Jeff, if you don't mind. You want to stay up here, and um, sure. If people have questions about things Jeff talked about, or even uh, more specific questions about um, different levels of agents of change, we are going to end up breaking off into smaller groups later on. But so, if you want to focus maybe questions on specifically what Jeff talked about, uh, maybe the literature he brought in, and then feel free to answer. And we'll take ten minutes or so. We'll go from there. Ricky, uh -huh. Wouldn't, I have a quick question, maybe then a longer one. Um, when you said there was a decrease in engagement from the first year to the fifth year of teachers, is that with students or is that with the system? That the teachers are from the system. Yeah, not the, not the kids themselves. Ah, but, okay. But, but how they feel about the profession. I almost died for that. students. Um, yeah. And so I've done a lot of, uh, I've done a couple of research papers on uh, No Child Left Behind, the Bush, and all that. And um, I understand all the changes that it made in the system, but I never really thought of until today what it was like beforehand. Did we, uh, did, this, did this system start, like now it seems like it starts at the governors you're talking about, uh, much higher than the actual school. For uh, No Child Left Behind, was it actually, you know, start at the school level, maybe the principal? Um, and then the parents, you know, I, I feel like when I was in school, my mom yelled at me instead of the school when I wasn't doing well in school. It seems like there's two major changes in the way that school was when that article was written. And now, um, do you see any so I, there? I mean, one, for one thing, when we think about some of the changes that are taking place in the system around like sort of assessments and testing and things like that, we have, those things have been around forever, right? I mean, at, at some level, not the intensity that it is now, but I, mean, I think if you grew up in your state, I'm sure we all here took regions or something, but there's always that sense of, I mean, we think about like, at its pure level, those, re some of those reforms, right? That, Testing is an assessment is what we all do. Like no good teacher doesn't assess their kids. And when you really become a master, you assess your kids all the time, right? Not in a way that like sort of destroys their love of learning <clears throat> and takes them away from learning while they're doing it. But like that's how we give kids our kids benchmarks and how we give them feedback and how we help them assess themselves, right? Um, but what's happened is is a fundamental change of pushing that sort of down on the system rather than I don't know if it if, it's, if it used to percolate up. Right? There's always been a a, a way to sort of oversee those things. I do think in some ways, I feel like it's like whole debate about the newest reforms, but I think my sense of it is that one of the purposes of these reforms back when they started was that there was a lot of parts of our system that weren't functioning well, right? That there, was a, there were a lot of schools that were failing a lot of kids. And I don't, it's not a debate about who's failing who here, but you know, if you look at our education system over the last 50 years, We've come enormously far away from where we were in the 1960s, which was still having incredible segregation in our schools, and we still do now, right? But we, but in a much more sort of official way, and a lot of kids not, a lot of kids being assumed about a lot of kids that they weren't capable of learning, and I think that the, 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 the good intentions around some of these reforms is to try to make standards across the board so that all kids have the same opportunity, but I don't. I think the problem is it's not about those ideas, right? It's not about these good ideas, it's about where those ideas come from. I think that's what, and that's why I think that our groups, to try to make it a question about what our groups can do, is that like, good ideas aren't, that's not what the system needs right now. The system needs right now is trust between all these parties, and it needs teachers to be driving those conversations, right? Like the, if you take, take apart every sort of like reform that's being pushed down, from the classroom level, we might actually agree with the concept, right? The concept of like having good assessment systems for teachers, so we can improve professionally, right, and learn from both peers and from instructional leaders within our schools. Like we all want that and know that's important, right? And teachers who are not doing good jobs can be supported to get better. Right? We all want that. Right? Assessment systems that appropriately measure kids' growth, so that when they apply to college, they're ready for college, not years behind. Right? We all want those things, right? And yet somehow we're being sold these changes within the system right now from higher levels 
And there's a, a lot of teachers are very frustrated with that because of the way that they've been implemented. Right? So again, this is where I like to, what I was trying to say earlier, right? like that the policy and practice of things, like it's good ideas, but because they're not necessarily coming from the bottom up, right, they seem they either implemented poorly or they seem offensive to those of us who really know what's necessary. And I don't know how that exactly changes, but I think that's the that's where the conversation feels like it should be taking place, right? Is how do we how do we start to control that in a different way? I don't know if that helps at all. That helps. I have a quick question. Um, I am voyeuristically monitoring the back page on Facebook right now, just kind of okay. taking the back seat until the craziness dies down, I guess. And some of the things are, um, somebody made a point the Everyone other day. Does everyone know what that is on about? The Badass Teachers Association. Um, and I, I think a lot of what we're talking about here and what the Western York Network of English Teachers and Educators for a Better Buffalo, I think what we're working toward as a community of educators, the group is also trying to work toward, but because of some of the frustrations that you were just mentioning and because of the policies that are coming down from places that we don't understand and we know people who don't understand are trying to bring about these changes, we're feeling it. A lot of teachers are really squeezed out, and I'm fortunate enough to be working at a school where we have a lot of teacher voice, too. So um, I, I don't see where a lot of that is coming from personally, but I do understand yeah. it in some of the other school districts. But that's um, more on the badass teachers and not really um, my question. But someone did um, post that they were one of their calls to action were to call their state education legislators and ask if they knew how some of these policies were actually working or how effective they were in, in the classroom mm -hmm. and whoever they actually got hold of and I don't know if they, it was an education person or a governor or senator or something when maybe they were talking about the conversion charts from the last regents exam or something they no one had ever sat down with them and said look at this there are only nine ways to get a, a mastery grade on the regents look at this there are only 18 ways that you could possibly pass the regents in 72 ways that you could fail horribly you know and nobody sat down with these governors or these senators and said look at what's going on look at what your education policy officials are this is what's being enforced right now did you know that with your experience in policy and advocacy are you finding that your questions and that your comments and concerns are being heard and that you're having conversations with people that um, that where that um, relationship between the policymakers and teachers where there's a space for that because maybe we feel like there's such a great divide and really just two people in a room or on a telephone call that need to hear each other's side you know because right. the policymakers probably aren't going home and like eating shards of glass like you yeah you sometimes wonder if it's just if it's as simple as like a no. relationship that things would be right. so much so much yeah. better right so just to be really clear like I, I have no policy uh, like changes to, to my credit, right? Like I have, I mean, no, no, I get, you know, UEB is probably as young or younger than mine, and so like we're trying to do that. And one of the things we're trying to do is fill this space um, of voices in the community, um, in Buffalo, particularly. And this, the state's a little more sort of far away, although a little bit, particularly at the local level. Like we hear a lot of talk about education, um, but it's very rarely um, teachers. Those that voice are teachers, and so, and there's nothing wrong with all those voices, right? The, the parents have a really important voice to play, right? The reform committee has a really important voice to play. You know, the board members and the officials and all those guys, like, they all need to be there for sure because they all have a piece of the pie. But um, the one group that's not really heard of that much are like just in-service professional individual teachers who have this experience and this is what they think about it. And so, um, like, there's just it's just not there at all. So, like, there's very like the governor's commission was a great example of. Um, like where that sort of like the connection between policymakers and, and so sort of people at a local level, and you know, a bunch of us spoke at the commission, and you know, I think we were heard in some ways, but who knows? I mean, it seems it does seem so far away in this like huge system that's been created, and, and that's where like that quote from the article was so good. It talks about like you know, everyone involved needs to like break up the assumptions that we've had. And that's we didn't we didn't do that. We haven't done that in the last fifty years. That's probably why things continue to sort of look and feel very 
very similar. Um, the Badass Teachers group is really fascinating. I don't know if people have checked it out or not, but like, it's just like a pure like space of like people's frustrate teachers' frustration, and I like totally get it, right? And I, I think like Amanda, like I don't in my school, I don't feel like the intense, like the suffocating sort of feel of like those assessments and APPR and all those other things, like. Not that we're totally shielded from it, but like maybe we, would, you know, one we have administrators that try to shield us from it as best we can. But like, but we also just found ways around that. Um, but, but if you feel that oppression, right? Like if you are, you know, a couple of friends that teach like in Buffalo, like are really good teachers, and like their time is wasted by the crap that they're meant to do. And like that's what I, that would make that would make me live it in a, and want to be a outrageous member of badass teachers as well, right? It's like if my professional like responsibilities and time felt the need, because um, I already know what, what I'm, do I'm doing things right, right? So it affects, like, it's incredible that those reforms, like, so they affect, like, the really master teacher, because the master teacher's been doing really good work so far, and then you're told, oh, you got to do it differently, you got to change it, because this is what you're supposed to do. Like, that's offensive. The problem is there's also a lot of teachers that aren't doing good work. Like, there are, right? There's a lot of teachers that are not, you know, it doesn't mean they should stop, leave, they should leave the profession. Some of them maybe should, but, like, they need help and support. And those things maybe aren't like what's best either. So like, it feels, or they feel, or they feel like they're being attacked because they're insecure about how they do in the classroom, right? And if you feel insecure, then your response is often anger and, and fear. Um, and so that's where it feels like that, those levels of trust and communication. And I, but that's like I hope we get to with these different groups, right? Is that we are able to be those voices to the politicians and those making policies. Mm -hmm. In this slide, it feels like I have just read a headline about Obama's coming to town and around New York, and something I read in the headline said something about it being about education. Yeah. And it feels so striking that all these big, important people are talking about education, but just as you say, of course, the voices of those who are right in the field are not part of it. And I guess I'm struck with, even in our government, you write your legislator, right? Or you write, you know, you're supposed to write somebody or call somebody's office or something. In education, what do we do? When the regents were given this June, I felt like I wanted to drive to Albany and like meet them. Like, who are you? <laughs> yeah. And, and I, who are you that will put this in our face and do this to us at this time? And I was infuriated. But it really felt like it was nowhere to go where I had anger. And and I I like, shouldn't we at least Figure out like, are we supposed to talk to somebody in the board of regents? Like, who? There's no obvious path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so why I have finished letter to Commissioner King, and uh, <laughs> it was going to mail in that book. So much reform, and and I feel like, you know, I I've almost started conversations with Bob Bennett, who I've crossed paths with, but he seems like in a different plane of things. But it, like, it's just so striking how there's an absence of any sort of channel. Yeah. Communication, like who? Like, and so the badass teachers, I understand that too, because it feels like you're infuriated. And I mean, I talk to you a lot of times. But <laughs> where do we go with that? And could we find that out? Or make those channels, create them. And yes, I think that that's what we're going to be talking about today. Right. For those of us that are interested at the state and the regional level, where is that communication? And if it doesn't exist, how can we begin that? That's a really, it's a very important point. Because it felt like in the time of Sobel, when they were, pro, when they were pushing the um, site-based management, there was an acknowledgement in policy of the need for many voices. And then that fell out of fashion, and then Mills came in with his own thing. And now King, I can't figure him out. And <laughs> so it feels like with King, my wish in the letter was partly wanting to demand that you're a leader, be a, be a leader of, of a of a collective voice in a democracy yeah. for something good. And, and he's not, you know, it doesn't seem to me that he is. And, and so don't we have some like proper place to demand that we have an audience? Right. And I understand that he didn't want to accept coming into Buffalo recently with that invitation that he got to come in about the other stuff. But it feels like, isn't there some way of creating? It feels like these people really are distant from us, like yeah. they're, they're not available to us, but they're paid by public funds, right? So mm -hmm. Yeah. Responsive? There's no accountability at their end. None. None. And then they do stuff that's so hurtful and yeah. so punishing, and it hurts our kids, and we watch it, and the notion of advocating, it's like they're hurting our children. Yeah. And, and we know it, and they're doing it. And, and to stand by seems so yeah. Yeah. 
unacceptable. It feels purposefully vague. Yeah, so, that's so right. I mean, in June, you look for somewhere to write. You do, and it's right. it's. I mean, I don't want to be too much of a conspiracy theorist, but it seems <laughs> very vague. You don't know who to contact, yeah. and so we have this energy, we have this desire to question it, to fight it. But it, it, yeah, like where do we go? Yeah. And I think um, this is a great place to start thinking about. Yeah. Which is right, like when there's no when it and when it remains vague, then you get like the conspiracy theories of just like. You have no idea. Like John King, if we were sitting in the yeah. room with him, might be like great. I mean, he's you know he has experience in schools. He's not like he's some like just some jerk type. Like because there's no like there's no trust and there's no relationships across the board. Then it's you're left feeling like mm -hmm. maybe it's you know maybe it's corporate driven like you know profits for these tests, right? Maybe it's that he wants to just take over the schools from like there's all these like things that just don't because you're left without any like, foundation to make. Like, Logical arguments, or like give people the benefit of the doubt without those built in relations. And you can have your hand on the truth. Um, I was just like, I was just sort of thinking as we were talking about salt. There's this organization, um, it's in, I don't know how many cities, it's not Buffalo, but we're called, um, called Teach Plus. And if we could, I, I don't have the expertise to do that, I don't, but they teach teachers how to get involved in politics. And like if, if we could if we could either get them to come here or recreate that somehow here with people who know how to do that, it, I don't know. It, that'd be really interesting. Yeah, Teach Plus is great. In fact, when you be started, we um, something the companies is that they're the founder that I sort of asked her to come here, but oh, really? they don't deal with cities that are have lots of money okay. and are much bigger. But but that doesn't mean that like and there's lot and there's other groups that are forming throughout the country that are sort of teacher based and but we can just be that, right? Like to learn how to, yeah. the things that they're teaching teachers, right, to have a voice, to learn to understand mm -hmm. policy, to like to advocate for what we think is best. But those are things we can do. We don't, you know, it's, there's models of what that looks like. Um, but there's enough skill just in this room right here, I think, to, to do that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's just getting ourselves together. Well, I guess um, sort of looking smaller than what we're talking about, if we start looking at the individual level of our schools where we're coming from, I mean, obviously, we're all from somewhere else, but maybe we also need to think about what can we do to take this energy here back to our buildings, because if we increase it more at that level, and then, you know, because if, because if all the schools are filled with teachers like us, then that's, that you, you can't ignore that anymore. But sometimes I think there's that tendency to, there's this energy here, and this is great, but then I, sometimes you go back to school, and depending on what situation you are in at your school, you might be this lonely island there. And, and you, we need to, I think, maybe start there with getting everybody else on board, not just, like, not just, you know, like, yeah. it, no, matter, no matter where you are, getting, getting everyone in your building, like, we can be agents of change there first, and, and maybe be positive and, and get people to sort of look at things not so much as always focusing on the negative that's being handed down, but hey, you've got that energy, take something, do something with it. How can I, I guess as a young teacher, go to some of these teachers who I know are older and more experienced than me, and without sounding like a cocky little know-it-all, say, stop complaining and do something about it, you know, get involved. This is, I, I think Megan's leading in almost directly into what we're going to talk about, oh, you know, yeah, after yeah. we take a break. This, the conversations we're having here are going to continue. It's not like we're just going to stop here. So, I mean, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, the questions were great, and I can see the conversation already starting, and that's kind of what we were hoping for, this idea of agents of change on the uh, first front level, basically, right? Classroom, you know, starting small and then moving bigger. And, you know, some people have that larger scale looking at the state, region level. Some people want to just start with their classroom, start with real small stuff. So we're going to take about a five-minute break, um, go to the bathroom, those type of things. When we come back, we are going to break up into smaller groups and have these larger discussions. So folks, let's keep us strict. I know we got started late. Winnie Nut works on soft openings. That's our <laughs> kind of time with this approach to time. Um, but we'll be real strict. Five minutes, grab some beverages that, and some refreshments that Amanda was nice enough to bring. The restrooms are somewhere in the building. And let's just give Jeff a really another round of applause. All right, pause this. I'm going to let you pause. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs>